Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon to our guest speaker. I'm Robert W. Matanke, president of the Decalogue uh, Foundation, which is the charitable arm of the Decalogue Society of Lawyers, charitable and educational. Uh, and today it is my pleasure to introduce our annual continuing legal education program, which we have been doing with the Lincolnwood Jewish Congregation, A.G. Beth Israel, for a number of years, starting out uh, when we wanted to do something in memory of our distinguished past president, Judge Gerald Bender, who was also a fine and wonderful member of the Lincolnwood Jewish Congregation. Uh, I want to make sure that I recognize and welcome Rabbi Yehuda Myers, the rabbi of the Lincolnwood Jewish Congregation, A.G. Beth Israel, as well as Rabbi Emeritus Joel Lairfield, uh, as well as uh, the president of the Decalogue Society of Lawyers, Judge Myron Makoff. I also want to thank Marsha Kramer, of the Lincolnwood Jewish Congregation, A.G. Beth Israel, who has once again helped us to put this program together. Uh, and uh, I am looking forward to an informative and illuminating and wonderfully exciting uh, lecture this morning by our guest speaker, direct from London, uh, Natasha Hausdorff. Uh, Natasha Hausdorff is a London-based barrister and a director of the uh, non-governmental organization, UK Lawyers for Israel. She speaks frequently on international law, foreign affairs, and national security policy, including at the United Nations and the Parliament of the United Kingdom. Natasha holds law degrees from Oxford University and Tel Aviv University, and was a fellow in the National Security Law Program at Columbia Law School. She was previously a solicitor and worked for American law firm Skadden Arps in London and in Brussels. Thereafter, she clerked for the president of the Israeli Supreme Court in Jerusalem, Chief Justice Miriam Naor. And now everyone, please uh, join me in presenting a warm welcome to our guest speaker, Natasha Hausdorff, who will present the topic of international law and the legal status of the West Bank, Judea and Samaria. Thank you. Well, Robert, thank you very much indeed. It's a, a real pleasure to be with you to discuss uh, international law and, and the legal status of the West Bank, Judea and Samaria. Um, and it's wonderful that I uh, can be here in London speaking to you across the Atlantic. Um, and it's very well welcome to see so many faces staring back at me. Um, I, I perhaps should start off by saying, um, given the very politicized nature of this topic and the many misrepresentations of international law vis-a-vis -vis Israel that abound uh, and the pervasiveness of several misconceptions about uh, the legal status of the disputed territories. Uh, this really is a vast topic. It's an area where clearly politics and law often overlap, um, and also where a, a special language of condemnation has developed in relation to illegal settlements um, inextricably linked with illegal occupation, which are unique in terms of their deployment with respect to Israel. And I will be submitting to you contrary to what international law truly says. And I'd like to stress before we begin that nothing I say ought to prejudge or predetermine what a political settlement might look like. That is a matter, of course, that ought to be distinct from a proper investigation of the legal status, because it will inevitably be informed by diplomatic and political considerations. But it's important that we have a proper understanding of the legal status of the territory as a starting point. And so the key issue that I wish to address uh, with you this morning is a fundamental rule of customary international law called uti possidetis juris that governs the legal status of this territory. And in order to answer the question of what international law truly tells us about the territory at the formation of the modern state of Israel in 1948. But before that, I propose to map out some of the key international legal instruments which preceded Israel's independence. And then after addressing uti possidetis juris, uh, I'll turn in the time available to the status of Jerusalem, the settlements issue, the impact of the Oslo Accords, and where we've ended up, perhaps touching, uh, if time allows, on the debate, which occurred a few years ago now, over Israel's proposal to apply civilian law to parts of Area C, which has been incorrectly termed a proposal on annexation. Uh, but before all of that, what, what is 
international law. I mean, it's unlike domestic law. Uh, it is a body of rules established by uh, two key sources um, and some others, but we'll focus on, on two of the key ones, custom and treaty. Um, and this system of law is recognised by nations as being binding in their relations with one another. So those true uh, key sources, treaty law is very um, similar, I suppose, to contract law. Um, and then the phenomenon of custom. And we'll come on to an important principle of custom. So I think it's, a, it's vital to have a, a real uh, sense of, of how that comes to be. But so far as a uh, treaty is concerned, parallels with, with contract law that we can draw out, um, international conventions, they're laws that states have signed themselves up to and bound themselves by, and they've made a conscious decision to do that. And by contrast, international custom um, is evidence of a, a general practice accepted as law. So custom arises essentially if states believe um, themselves to be bound to behave in a certain way, behave in that fashion, and then therefore become bound uh, to behave uh, in the fashion that they've adopted. That behavior itself um, generates a customary principle of international law, which at a certain point in time binds them. There are a couple of big misconceptions that I thought it's worth dealing with briefly just at the outset also, um, principally to do with UN resolutions, which are generally not a source of law. The legal status of a UN resolution is determined by the chapter of the UN Charter under which it's made. So the UN Charter is the governing document of the United Nations. Uh, it sets out the competences of each of the composite institutions, as well as the legislative processes. Resolutions made under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter are the strongest legal tool in the UN legislative box. They're rarely made. Such a resolution is immediately binding on all member states, um, and it often requires military intervention. So uh, two examples of these. One is Resolution 678 in 1990 with respect to Iraq, where the Security Council gave Iraq a set period to withdraw from Kuwait and empowered states to use all necessary means to force Iraq out of Kuwait after the deadline. Uh, a further uh, example comes in the aftermath of 9-11, where the UN Security Council in Resolution 1373 on the 28th of September 2001, in response to the 9-11 attacks, famously uh, made a resolution under the Chapter 7 rubric so that it would be binding on all member states. And it called on member states to do a number of things, including freezing terrorist financing, passing anti-terrorism laws, uh, preventing sus suspected terrorists from travelling across international uh, borders. And again, that was made so as to be legally effective and binding. If a resolution is not made under Chapter 7 and does not explicitly state that it's made under Chapter 7, it's automatically made under Chapter 6. Those resolutions um, are generally not binding unless they meet particular criteria which have been set down uh, by the International Court of Justice. And there's a big debate um, about whether the International Court of Justice can, in fact, expand the legal effect of resolutions. Um, that original distinction between Chapter 6 and Chapter 7 resolutions is, is the one that people generally agree on. Um, and it makes sense that the vast majority of resolutions that are passed and those, in fact, that we deal with with respect to Israel are made under Chapter 6 and not Chapter 7 because it's much easier politically, uh, especially at the United Nations, to pass a resolution without legal teeth. So the first of the, of the three topics that I want to grapple with um, is, is to briefly rattle through the aspects of the historical legal developments prior to 1948. Um, and in particular, um, the leaders of the principal successful allies in the First World War met at uh, San Remo between the 19th and 26th of April 1920 to discuss the future of the former territories of the Turkish Empire in the Middle East. They had already agreed uh, in the covenant of the League of Nations, which formed 
part of the Treaty of Versailles in 1919, that these territories should be placed under mandates of the League of Nations, where there were official statements expressing uh, support for the establishment, specifically in Palestine, of a national home for the Jewish people. Now, at San Remo, the Allies resolved that Syria and Mesopotamia shall be provisionally recognised as independent states, subject to rendering of administrative advice and assistance by the mandatory powers uh, until a time at which, uh, which they were able to stand alone. And in relation to what was then Palestine, they resolved that the mandatory will be responsible for putting into effect the declaration originally made in November 1917 by the British uh, government and then adopted by other allied powers in favour of the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. The mandate for Palestine, formulated by the Allies, was then duly approved by the Council of the League of Nations on the 24th of July 1922. And in its preamble, it noted that the principal Allies had agreed that the mandate should be responsible for putting into effect the declaration that was made in November 1917, the Balfour Declaration, um, which I believe you, you've all got um, copies of in, in the extracts that have been circulated. Um, and that also called for the uh, voice support for the establishment in Palestine and the national home for the Jewish people. But that wording filtered through, uh, set through to San Remo and, of course, into the mandate uh, provisions itself. Um, and it recognised, uh, really, in that sense, uh, the historical connection of the Jewish people with Palestine. Um, the grounds that there were for reconstituting uh, a national home there. And it also recognised Jews uh, as indigenous people of Palestine. In particular, Article 2 of the mandate, substantive provisions, provided that the mandatory shall be responsible for placing the country under such political, administrative and economic conditions as will secure the establishment of the Jewish national home as laid down in the preamble. I think you've got some extracts of that. Um, and further provisions were set out, um, noting the obligations and arrangements for putting this into effect. Uh, for example, Article 6, which provided that the administration of Palestine, while uh, ensuring that rights um, and the position of other sections of the population are not prejudiced, shall facilitate immigration under suitable conditions and shall encourage close settlement by Jews on land, on the land, forgive me, um, including state lands and waste lands not required for public purposes. So the preamble and the substantive provisions of the mandate as a whole indicate that its primary object was the reconstruction or the reconstitution of the Jewish uh, home, national home in Palestine. And the result of the arrangements agreed at San Remo across all of the mandates that were proposed was that 96.3% of the Middle East territories which had been liberated by the Allies from the Turkish Empire were allocated for the creation of new Arab states, now Iraq, Syria, Lebanon and Jordan. And that strip of land between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea amounting to 3.7% of the liberated territories, was allocated to the reconstitu reconstitution of the Jewish national home. The agreements were approved at the time by the international community, including Arab leaders, and they were enshrined in legally binding international agreements, including the League of Nations mandate for Palestine. And the character of the League of Nations mandates um, as international agreements were addressed by the International Court of Justice in the South West Africa cases um, in 1962. But then in 1946, the League of Nations was dissolved and it was replaced by the United Nations. Now, it's important to note that the rights and obligations under the mandates remained in force in accordance with Article 80, specifically subsection 1, of the UN Charter. The UN Charter envisaged that the mandates of the League of Nations would be replaced by UN trusteeships, but no UN trusteeship agreement was concluded in respect of Palestine. 
And in late 1947, Britain declared its intention to evacuate its administration and forces from that territory. I'm sure you're all um, familiar with Resolution 181 of the UN General Assembly, which recommended a plan of partition of the remaining territory of the Palestine Mandate west of the Jordan, or the Arava Line. But the plan was rejected by Arab states and representatives of the um, local uh, Arab population, and it was was not implemented. And we've already uh, addressed the fact that a UN General Assembly resolution has no legal status. Uh, This was a a political recommendation which was rejected by neighbouring Arab leadership and the local population. Uh, So its relevance uh, essentially to the legal analysis ends there. Representatives of the local Jewish community in the land of Israel declared the establishment of the Jewish state to be known as the State of Israel on the 14th of May 1948, on the eve of the British uh, departure. No other state was established in the territory west of the Jordan or the Arava line. You've got a copy of the Declaration of Independence. No reference to territory is made. Um, And so we are essentially left with um, the lines uh, that pre-existed the state. And I'm going to try and share my screen just so that we can all have a look together. If I can actually find the right. While you're doing that, Natasha, I want to remind everybody that uh, we will have your presentation first for approximately one hour, uh, and that'll be followed by a uh, a lengthy opportunity for questions and answers. I've already posted that if you have any questions as we're going, post them in the chat box, and uh, I will be moderating all those questions as we go. If time permits, we may even allow for a discussion towards the end of the hour and a half session. Now you've got the uh, map up, thank you. Thank you, I'm looking forward to that. That's always my favorite part. So just so that everyone's on the same page, this was the original mandate for Palestine before the severance of Transjordan, uh, which uh, occurred in 1922. It became the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan and the administrative line runs along the Jordan River all the way south to the Red Sea. And we can see that in particular if I share the aftermath um, of that division in this map here, where we've got the former British mandate, the severance of Transjordan, and then the British mandate of Palestine. And so in 1948, when the British vacate, these are the lines uh, that we are dealing with. This is the remainder of the mandate. Um, And that's crucial for when we come on to the application of customary law and an assessment of uh, the status of the territory at Israel's independence. There is a fundamental rule of customary international law that establishes the borders of newly emerging states at independence, as in Israel's case in 1948. Uh, It is universally applied. In the 19th century, it was applied in South America. Um, It was later applied in Africa, in Asia, and still later at the uh, disintegration of the former communist federations. And it was applied to all of the states that emerged in all of those cases. It was also applied to states emerging from former mandates. The mandate for Mesopotamia, when it became the Kingdom of Iraq, and mandates for Syria and Lebanon, um, really in all cases involving mandates, this was the default rule for the states that emerged from those administrative units, and also in the case of Jordan, uh, when it emerged. Um, The universal rule for determining those borders of newly emerging states at the moment of independence states that a new state takes on the boundaries of the pre-existing administrative unit as its international borders. And as I mentioned, that rule is called uti possidetis juris. It is a default rule. So anywhere where there is no agreement to the contrary, that rule is applied as a matter of customary international law to provide certainty, to avoid frontiers being challenged, Uh, wars breaking out, to promote peace and stability, in particular to to avoid fratricidal struggles. Those are the words words, and those are the reasons the International Court of Justice recognised as being behind the development 
of this rule in the 1986 Burkina Faso Mali case. Now, the application of the principle has the effect of freezing the territorial title, which exists at the moment, of independence to produce uh, what the, the chamber described in, the, in, in that Burkina Faso Mali case, uh, the chamber of the court described it as the photograph of the territory at the critical date. Um, and Malcolm Shaw has written, Professor Malcolm Shaw has written uh, at great length on the history of the principle. Um, it's unaffected, uh, the principle, by the emergence, he says, of the right of self-determination. Um, and there we, we can come on perhaps to discuss that in more detail uh, in, in the Q&A. But the principle lies, um, it has a primary aim of securing respect for the territorial boundaries at the moment when independence is achieved. Uh, and that was also reaffirmed by the court, the International Court of Justice in the land, island and maritime uh, frontier disputes involving El Salvador and Honduras um, in 1992. Uh, and also in Nicaragua and Colombia um, in more recently in, in 2012. Now, another fundamental rule of international law is its equal application. You cannot have a general rule and an exception for a country you just don't like very much or you have some political or ideological opposition to. That's not how any respectable legal system can operate. So the question is, what does this principle, uh, universally applied, tell us about the legal status of the territory in Israel's case? Well, in 1948, as we've just seen on the maps, the administrative lines of the eastern side of the British mandate ran along the Jordan River all the way to the south, dividing it from that separate administrative unit of Transjordan, which became uh, the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. Uh, and I should stress that that also followed the rule of Otipostatus Iuris. So as the only state to emerge from the mandate territory that was left in 1948, under that rule, Israel automatically assumes as its international borders, the administrative lines of the mandate that preceded it. And that includes East Jerusalem and the West Bank, which uh, in the course of the war, Israel's war of independence was occupied by Jordan. Um, Israel's War of Independence that ran from 1948 to uh, 1949. Those same areas were then recovered by Israel in 1967. Uh, and here I think it's important just to give everyone a, a bit of context and also because, you know, as lawyers, we always look to precedent and we look to how law is applied in other cases to understand how it ought to be applied in the instant case that we're grappling with. And one instance that everyone is now painfully familiar with um, is that of Ukraine and Russia's occupation of Crimea. Now, Ukraine's borders also followed the rule of Utiposidetis Juris uh, when it became a state. And that is why uh, Crimea was uh, formed part of Ukraine. It was within those borders and internationally recognized to be so. Uh, again, the international community has been very clear uh, in its stance that Russia's invasion and occupation um, of Crimea um, has been uh, unlawful. But the position now is that Ukraine, of course, is is uh, doing better by the day in its um, ongoing uh, in the ongoing conflict after Russia's invasion. Uh, if it were hypothetically um, able to turn the tables to such an extent that it were to recover Crimea uh, from Russia, no one, but no one, would accuse Ukraine of occupying Crimea from Russia. And yet that is exactly what we are presented with when we hear the suggestion that Israel is in occupation of the West Bank. Um, and it's a stark contrast, and it's not one uh, that those that are uh, advancing that claim um, seem to have grappled with the, um, the incongruous nature of those two issues side by side. So the legal status um, of the territory um, applying that rule indicates that Israel has been the sovereign since 1948. There has been no agreement 
on any of any kind on transfer of sovereignty since 1948. And um, the agreements that do exist reinforce the application of uti posteditis juris because they make reference back to the administrative lines of the mandate. So first in the armistice agreements um, between Israel, uh, in particular Jordan and Egypt, uh, in 1949, um, at the end of, of the War of Independence, reference is made back to the boundaries of the 1920 mandate. Um, and of course, it's important to reference the context in which those agreements were made. This was um, seven Arab states um, and some local, uh, some elements of the local Arab population that essentially sought to destroy the Jewish state by force immediately upon Israel's declaration of independence. The new state beat back the Arab armies, except in the area of Judea and Samaria, um, which was later named the West Bank, where uh, Jewish communities, in including the Jewish quarter of the old city of Jerusalem, um, were overrun, uh, ethnically cleansed. Uh, and the hostilities were terminated by these armistice agreements in 1949, which delineated lines beyond which the armed forces of uh, the respective parties would not move. And those became known as the Green Lines. It's important to stress that in all of these agreements, the parties are adamant that these lines have uh, no uh, indication of borders. Uh, they are without prejudice to any future agreement on borders. Um, and yet we frequently hear them now being referred to in common parlance as the 1967 borders. Those are the 1949 armistice lines. Um, and the agreements make clear that they were never intended to have any legal validity. Um, no agreement on borders really until the peace agreements, um, in particular the Treaty of Peace between the State of Israel and the Arab Republic of Egypt in 1979, and you have some extracts, um, in particular Article 2.1, uh, where it states that the permanent boundary between Egypt and Israel is recognised as the international boundary between Egypt and the former mandatory territory of Palestine, which is shown in a map there. Again, without prejudice in that case to the um, issues to do with the status of, of the Gaza Strip, um, but importantly, reference back to the mandatory borders, which are the only uh, borders really that have been in existence. Uh, the Treaty of Peace also between the State of Israel and the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan in 1994, um, and in Article 3, there's reference back to the international boundary um, between those parties being delineated with reference to the boundary definitions under the mandate um, and reference to maps uh, that uh, outline the position there. So um, the legal status uh, at Israel's independence, I, I would submit is crucial because it tells us that Israel's presence in the territory now uh, is lawful crucially that it's not a situation of occupation. Um, and the framework of the law of occupation, uh, I should spend a few minutes touching on um, separately from, from the analysis of the status of the territory, because occupation developed in public international law, not originally to protect the rights of ordinary people, but to protect the rights of a former sovereign during a period in which they were ousted from their territory. So even if one were to quibble with um, the customary international law and, and reject the application of Oti Posidetis Juris, uh, to say that those universal rules um, don't apply for some reason to Israel, there is simply no other sovereign ousted from their territory which would trigger the proper application of the uh, framework and the situation of occupation. Um, and it's the framework of occupation in which we as international lawyers, apply the Geneva Conventions. Though that doesn't work where there is no sovereign from which um, Israel is said to have acquired the land. Jordan, which uh, controlled, which occupied that territory before 1967, was not a legitimate sovereign. Um, and um, its presence there was, was not recognised by the vast majority of the international community. Of course, it didn't comply with international law in that it ethnically cleansed East Jerusalem and, and the West Bank of its Jews. And the occupation framework, um, furthermore, doesn't apply after a peace agreement, such as the peace agreement between Israel and Jordan in 1994. 
And that was even recognized in the famous uh, Hansel Memorandum in the US on settlements, which was, of course, revisited uh, by Secretary of State Pompeo. And even in that memorandum, it was suggested, which was, of course, drafted before the peace agreement in 1994 between Israel and Jordan. But it was um, acknowledged in the memorandum that peace between the respective parties uh, would put an end to any uh, situation of occupation that it argued existed. So what's Israel's approach uh, to the West Bank been after 1967? Because it was different uh, to its approach to Jerusalem. Um, But first, perhaps we we ought to start with what the approach to Jerusalem was. And um, Israel, in its Declaration of Independence, I mentioned did not contain any reference um, to Jerusalem as its capital or, or any reference to borders. But in 1949, in December, the Knesset decided that Jerusalem would be the capital of Israel. And on the 26th of December 1949, the Knesset held its first session in West Jerusalem. In January 1950, the Israeli uh, parliament again declared Jerusalem to be the capital of the state of Israel. And when uh, Israeli forces ousted Jordanian forces from East Jerusalem uh, and the West Bank in the Six Day War, which ended on the 10th of June 1967, Israel immediately took steps to extend its law, administration and jurisdiction over the whole of Jerusalem using the terminology areas formerly part of mandatory Palestine. Again, important references back to those mandatory uh, borders and territories. In July 1967, um, then Minister of of Foreign Affairs Abba Eben also informed UN Secretary of State in writing that those acts did not constitute annexation. And um, again, I would suggest that goes back to Israel's underlying status uh, as as original sovereign in the territory. Now, the Supreme Court um, considered the legal status of Jerusalem in a 1993 case, the Temple Mount Faithful Association uh, against the Attorney General um, in 1993. Um, And in that case, uh, Justice Menachem Elon gives what's considered to be the most comprehensive discussion of the status of Jerusalem. The court emphasized that the Temple Mount is part of the territory of the State of Israel and the sovereignty of the State of Israel extends uh, over it said unified Jerusalem in general and over the Temple Mount in particular. And therefore, all the laws of Israel apply to the Temple Mount, including those laws guaranteeing freedom uh, of uh, worship, the right of access to um, and the protection from desecration of of the holy places. Uh, And we can certainly have a conversation about whether or not uh, that has been maintained. But that was the the judgment of the court in, in that case. Um, Looking at the West Bank in particular now uh, and the question of settlements, um, while acknowledging perhaps the the absence of uh, international consensus on on a legal framework which properly addresses the territory, I do want to move to look at the potential application of the Geneva Conventions on the hypothesis that the Fourth Geneva Convention applies de jure in law, uh, because that is what the criticism of Israeli settlements has been based on. Specifically, Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Convention, which I, again, I believe you will have copies of. Um, and the international discourse on Israeli settlement activity re- revolves around this article, which provides that the occupying power shall not deport or transfer parts of its own civilian population into the territory it occupies. That's specifically Article 49.6. And it's on this basis that settlement, Israeli settlement policy has been criticized as a breach of international law by the International Court of Justice, the Security Council, the International Committee of the Red Cross, um, and various countries and international uh, commentators. There are two substantial errors with this criticism. Um, in my submission. And the first is the question of the applicability of the provisions of um, occupation to the disputed territory, um, which I've already discussed when we looked at the status of the territory in international law. The second error relates to the mischief 
which Article 49.6 was designed to counter. And indeed, the context in which this article was um, drafted was the aftermath of World War II and the forced transfer of populations by the Nazi regime. And the full text of Article 49 prohibits individual or mass forcible transfers. The article was uh, directed against the heinous practice of the Nazi regime during its occupation of Europe of forcibly transporting populations, uh, either of which it wished to rid itself uh, into or out of uh, occupied territories um, for the purpose of of killing them or to provide slave labour. And it's clear to me that the article is as a whole, concerned with the forced transfer of populations against their will. And the last paragraph, paragraph six, which relates to an occupier's own civilian population, has to be seen also uh, in that context of uh, forced transfer, or at least government transfer. And that position is reinforced um, with reference to the discussions over the drafting of the convention, which indicate that amendments were proposed and debated in the context of the transfers of populations against their will. Now, the application of these provisions to Israeli settlements remains problematic, as when we think that the settlement movement concerns individuals and collectors voluntarily moving to the area after 1967. The provision against transfer cannot objectively uh, be construed to cover the voluntary movement of individuals, not as a result of state transfer, but of their own volition and as an expression of their personal choice. So the restriction on transfer is a restriction on government action. It's not a requirement that government stop civilian movement into the area, although I should say that the Israeli government has on occasion done exactly this, where it had a legal basis on which to remove individuals who uh, were, in in some cases, settling on private land. Um, But the spontaneous or voluntary movement of Israeli nationals simply does not trigger uh, the text of Article 49.6 under any interpretation. Um, And it's worth noting uh, that there are a couple of Israeli Supreme Court decisions touching on these issues, The court has been a a driving force in a number of cases involving the removal of settlements. Um, And the court has a a strong reputation, um, I would say, in the international legal community for dealing with these complex and controversial issues and for being a pioneer in the application of public international law in a domestic context. And it's been tasked on a number of occasions with finding a way through the legal quagmire in the absence of a a widely accepted body of law applicable to the territory, it's followed the Israeli government's uh, legal department's practice of applying certain principles um, from the Geneva Conventions together with domestic legal principles of non-discrimination and equality. And sitting in its capacity as the High Court of Justice, it frequently deals with petitions on a a case-by-case basis. Um, It's acknowledged the absence of an appropriate legal framework in international law for the situation. It has addressed the settlement question in a number of of high profile cases, each time based on the individual factual matrix. And it sought in this way to provide redress on the facts of the case to the extent that they uh, were well founded in law. So one example is the 1979 case of Elon Moret, where the court dealt with um, a specific instance of the expropriation of private land on the argument that it was necessary uh, to meet the needs of the army, which is uh, under the ICRC codification of um, customary international law, under Rule 50, military necessity is provided uh, as a justification um, for requisition of land. Now, the Israeli court was not convinced by the arguments of of the state um, and the army that this was necessary for military purpose, and it determined that the use of the land was illegal in this instance, and the settlement was removed. Um, Compare perhaps to the 1993 case of Bargil, where the petitioner sought to challenge uh, the legality of settlements in general, and they were basing arguments on public international law, referencing Article 49.6, But that petition was denied. Um, It was held to be defective as it related to questions of policy within the jurisdiction of other branches of a democratic government. 
um, arising predominantly, um, so forgive me, it was suggested that they were raising predominantly um, political as opposed to legal questions. And the president of the court, uh, Chief Justice Shamgar, in that case, recognised that the issue of settlements is a, an ideological one um, and that the court could only uh, intervene uh, in cases where there was a, a proper legal basis to do so. I'd like, um, as we're coming towards the end of, of, of the initial um presentation uh, to spend a little bit of time looking at the wider treatment of settlement activity um, because again I think other examples are instructive um, when, when we as lawyers are trying to work out what the position um, is proper, properly here and this has been the subject of a, a seminal piece of work by Professor Eugene Kontorovich um, by way of, of um, sort of justification of, of my drawing on, on this piece of work, a fundamental principle of international law is its equal application. Um, and the international community uh, has consistently acquiesced to government orchestrated settlement activity in situations of real occupation, um, places uh, unlike uh, the West Bank, where occupation exists as contemplated by the Geneva Conventions. Uh, and where these governments have orchestrated settlement activity to, and it forms part of, of the policy of the belligerent occupier. Um, and Eugene Kontrovovich gives a number of examples of this. He talks about East Timor, where the Indonesian occupation involved a large scale settlement enterprise run in a highly organized manner <clears throat> by the occupying power, uh, whose goals were explicitly to change the demographic balance in the occupied territory. Now, a special tribunal was set up to investigate crimes committed during the Indonesian rule, but the transfer of settlers was not among them. Professor Kontorovich talks about Western Sahara, where Morocco's settlement program is one of the longest, largest, and most ambitious. Uh, it involved transporting hundreds of thousands of settlers across a vast desert, implanting them in a, in a difficult and hostile environment, at great expense to the occupying power, but Morocco has never been accused of violating Article 496 by state representatives or international organizations. And that is despite there being significant interest in the situation and also repeated criticisms of Morocco's presence in the territory, but no state or international organization has commented in any way on the settlement policy. In Northern Cyprus, the ongoing Turkish occupation constitutes one of the most substantial settlement enterprises today. And it's particularly noticeable because it takes place within the territory of the European Union. And the majority of the population now consists of settlers with a substantial ongoing influx, but no international organization and no state aside from the Republic of Cyprus has described the settlement program as a violation uh, of the Geneva Conventions or otherwise illegal. Um, and it's of particular note because the EU is very active and a consistent critic of what it sees as illegal settlement activity in the West Bank, but it has not used uh, similar expressions there. In Lebanon, one of the larger mass movements of civilians into occupied territory occurred during the Syrian occupation between 1982 in 1990, Syria's control qualified as occupation uh, and essentially triggered the Geneva Conve uh, Convention protections. And there's massive movement of Syrian civilians into Lebanon, um, and that was consistent with the government policy, but it met with uh, almost no international notice uh, or comment, and it's never been discussed in the context of Article 49. In Cambodia, uh, several hundred thousand Vietnamese settlers came to Cambodia during the decade of occupation by Vietnam between 1978 and 1990. Now, many were returning, um, having fled in the previous decade, but there were others who came as, as new migrants, establishing themselves as traders. The UN Security Council failed to address the Vietnamese invasion um, and occupation uh, essentially because of a threatened Soviet veto. But the General Assembly dealt with it in annual resolutions, expressing serious concern at reported demographic changes, but none of those resolutions mentioned Article 49.6 or suggested any violation of international law 
resulting from those changes. In Azerbaijan, the Nagorno-Karabakh region has historically had a substantial Armenian majority. Uh, demographics have um, been a central aspect of the Karabakh conflict, and during the occupation, Armenia encouraged substantial migration into the territory. Now, international discussion, uh, including in the European Parliament, of the Karabakh conflict recognizes it as an occupation, but no one has declared this to be an Article 49.6 violation or has called for removal of settlers. And we come to Russia uh, and its occupation of uh, Georgia in Abkhazia and Crimea, which I've also mentioned. It's um, worthy of note with respect to Georgia and the regions of Abkhazia and South Ossetia, as a result of the Russian-Georgian war in uh, 2008, Russia took complete control of those separatist areas. And since the war, there has been, uh, well, nominal uh, Abkhaz authorities have, have engaged in a, a centralised state-sponsored uh, programme to settle people in that territory, with, again, the explicit purpose of changing the demographics. The settlement project is accompanied by what appear also to be efforts to force out ethnic Georgians from the territory, uh, policies limiting their freedom of movement, economic viability, education choices. There's been no criticism of the project in terms of Article 49.6. And looking to Ukraine with respect to Crimea, uh, Russia's occupation and annexation of the Crimean Peninsula um, in the spring of 2014, provoked widespread international outrage and condemnation, uh, and the occupation has been accompanied by large-scale human rights abuses, including the expulsion of protected persons from the territory. But despite the international attention, and also, crucially, the imposition of sanctions on Russia for many other violations of international law related to Crimea, no country, international organisation or international human rights group has said anything about Crimea settlers or even attempted to monitor settlement activity. So in none of these situations is this settlement activity criticised as illegal. It's not the case that the activity itself has escaped international attention. In many of these contexts, the international community has been critical of conduct. It's highlighted various violations of international law, but not commented on settlements. Um, and I would commend the uh, article by Professor Kontarevich, Unsettled, a global study of settlements um, in occupied territories, um, uh, I believe published while he was at Northwestern University. Um, now, the failure to raise legal objections, uh, he describes there as, as consistent and general, and it extends to international organizations and groups like UN uh, Human Rights Commission, the ICRC, uh, as well as humanitarian uh, NGOs like Human Rights Watch, whose work uh, and whose purpose it is to systematically point out violations of these norms. And so there is an argument on the back of, of that research that the lack of an international response to these activities in fact, has the effect of legitimizing the policy of government orchestrated settlement projects as the development of um, public international law through custom is rooted in state practice um, and international acquiescence uh, to a practice uh, can be inferred from the absence of condemnation. Um, it's very rare that you have uh, affirmative approval in establishing um, opinio juris. And when we consider that the only example in international law where the issue of settlements has been criticised as illegal is with respect to Israel, I think we have to ask ourselves whether the motivation behind that criticism is in fact political rather than legal. Um, I indicated that I would touch on uh, the Oslo Accords and try and bring us um, up, up to date. Now, after 1967, in Judea and Samaria, um, outside of, of Jerusalem, Israel governed initially, uh, as I indicated, by military administration. Um, and from 1981, also by a civil administration, which was established by military order, and that was um, Order 947 of the 8th of November 1981. Now, Israel has not extended its laws generally to, the, to that region, but it has maintained in force existing laws, which were varied and supplemented by Israeli military orders. 
Israeli citizens and companies in uh, the disputed territories are also subject to Israeli laws that apply to them um, in persona. In the Oslo Accords in 1993 and 1995, the government of Israel and the Palestine Liberation Organization, the PLO, representing the Palestinian people, agreed to achieve a lasting and comprehensive peace settlement and historical reconciliation um, through a, an agreed political process. Uh, until agreement could be reached on the permanent status, various uh, specified powers of the administration in Judea and Samaria were delegated by Israel to a Palestinian authority, which we refer to as, as the PA. Now, Judea and Samaria were also divided into three sets of areas, area A, B and C. And I can share uh, a map of those also so that you have an idea of what they look like. Now, in areas A and B, um, all um, civil powers and responsibilities were transferred to the Palestinian Authority, uh, though Israel retained overriding responsibility for security in area B. And various powers and responsibilities were not related um, to the territory in, in Area C were also transferred to the Palestinian Authority, except for issues to be negotiated in the permanent status negotiations, which were envisaged, and those included Jerusalem, uh, settlements, borders, and foreign relations. Um, now, I have a few minutes left, so I want to briefly touch on, uh, as I indicated, the um, debate over so-called annexation. Uh, and there is an issue with terminology, which I'll come on to, to, to address more specifically. Um, the use of terminology here, um, and in particular the term annexation, to describe Israel's proposed application of civilian law to parts of Area C, and, and this was something that was mooted um, by previous government under prime, former Prime Minister, about to be Prime Minister again, Netanyahu. Uh, but it was discussed in terms of annexation, where I would suggest the term is wholly inappropriate, not just because, as we have seen, under proper application of international law, Israel um, is the only candidate as an underlying sovereign. But it is also a misrepresentation of what was being proposed. And in case it comes back into discussion, um, I, I thought it prudent to address this with you. A definition of, an, of annexation from the Oxford Encyclopedia of International, of Public International Law, forgive me, uh, is as follows. Annexation means the forcible acquisition of territory by one state at the expense of another state. So annexation is about taking for yourself territory belonging to another state. It's, again, what Russia did in Crimea in 2014. It's also what Germany did with Austria in 1938. And it's what Jordan tried to do in the West Bank between 1948 and 1967. Now, opponents of Israel who use the term annexation make a series of, I would suggest, false assumptions. First, they assume that Israel lacks a claim of sovereignty to the territory. They assume uh, that another state actually holds sovereign title to the territory. And they assume that when Israel applies its laws, it will be breaking some other state's um, uh, territorial integrity. And it's unfortunate that the terminology of annexation is, is being wrongly deployed here, because I think it's a prime example of where the rhetoric of international law conflicts with the reality and where uh, a rule may be uh, made up or deployed in distortion of international law against Israel. And I think that's also why you don't see these rules being applied elsewhere. The administrative regime that Israel established in 1967 was intended to be temporary because it was anticipated, it was, was hoped by Israel that a negotiated peace agreement at that time with Jordan could be swiftly achieved, which would bring an end to that temporary administrative arrangement. Uh, and which might uh, very uh, possibly involve a change to sovereignty and borders as part of a negotiated settlement. Over 50 years later, um, it, it is unreasonable to expect Israel um, to maintain just a situation of limbo. It is a situation where Knesset legislation does not apply to these areas properly, where there is therefore a, a devastatingly confusing patchwork 
of legal administration. So you have leftover Jordanian law, Ottoman law, British mandate law, and often utter confusion at how these regulate 21st century issues where there is a total absence of environmental legislation and the sorts of provisions which benefit the rest of the country where civilian law is applied in full. So the proposal of applying Israeli civilian law in these areas um, also, I think, we need to recognise brings with it significant benefits to the local population, uh, Jewish and Arab. Um, it's not correct either, I think, to suggest that ordinary Palestinian Arabs who might be uh, impacted by these proposals will necessarily oppose them, because at the time uh, at which the proposal was being discussed, um, that, that there was uh, certainly mixed feelings about that. Residents of the area, in fact, stand to gain substantially uh, if, if proposals of this nature are brought forward in terms of access to healthcare. Uh, access to the welfare system, uh, to social security benefits, the, the right to vote in municipal elections, and other rights that attach to residency, including the possibility of acquiring citizenship, uh, and therefore all of the rights and benefits that attach to being um, a citizen of the only democracy um, in the Middle East. And that's why I think we saw um, certain uh, Palestinian Arabs also voting with their feet and moving into areas uh, before that discussion, which had been slated for ad Israeli administration in the past, where similar proposals were mooted with respect to uh, suburbs of Jerusalem, uh, individuals were moving in order to potentially secure the benefit, the benefits of living under full Israeli administration, um, as opposed to that temporary uh, patchwork administration that um, I uh, gave a, a brief overview of. Um, finally, I ought to also uh, stress that that none of what was being proposed or what may yet again be proposed uh, in terms of the application of civilian law prejudices any uh, final settlement. And indeed, nothing that I've discussed today um, dictates what any final settlement would look like. Any proposals around a two-state solution have envisaged uh, sovereign Israeli territory being transferred uh, via land swaps. Uh, most recently, um, in the Trump plan, there was a proposal that this would um, include parts of the Negev being transferred in that fashion. So in that sense, it doesn't affect the situation, um, uh, the, the, the potential future settlement situation. Uh, Israel is able to negotiate over territory to which it, its laws apply, uh, and it has done so in, in the past. Um, I think that's been a whistle-stop tour through some pretty complex areas of international law and, and also uh, you know, unavoidably political history. But I hope it, it starts to paint a, a picture of, of um, how international law is, is uh, increasingly, unfortunately, misrepresented in relation to Israel. I can see that there are a load of questions already in the chat, and I'm really looking forward to a discussion with you. But Robert, I'm in your hands as to how we manage that. Thank you, Natasha. Uh, that was a, a very inclusive presentation in only one hour of about, uh, well, at least 75 years of history or more. And I appreciate your uh, putting it together in such a cogent form. One thing I would ask if you could, because I think that there's uh, going to be certain questions that I'm seeing over here with regards to the 1993 Oslo Accords and the 1995 agreement with regards to the map that we had on just ever so briefly showing A, B, and C areas. If you could talk about that just briefly, that might help uh, some of the understanding as we get into some of the questions that have been posed. Yeah, of course. Um, the first thing probably to stress um, with respect to those agreements is that they were intended to be temporary. Um, and the uh, both envisaged an ongoing negotiation process, which unfortunately simply hasn't taken place. Um, but the temporary agreements um, that were established uh, provided for essentially self-governance by the Palestinians under the Palestinian Authority. Um, in the documents that have been circulated, you may very well have noticed um, pretty substantial reference to a political process and elections within the Palestinian Authority and also the council that was established uh, to govern in particular in Area C. Uh, and of course, that is one of the key aspects. Um, there are many others, but one of the key aspects of, of what was envisaged by the Oslo Accords that simply hasn't materialised. 
I think Mahmoud Abbas is now in the 17th year of his four-year term. But um, what has Men, been maintained uh, are the delineations between areas A, B and C, which you can see represented on the map, um, and that the Palestinian Authority has um, full control over area A. Uh, it shares control over area B in that it has civil control, whereas Israel maintains uh, a security um, presence and a security control over B. And area C, which is where the vast majority of, of Jewish communities live, um, is uh, under the full um, civil and, and military or security administration of Israel. So that is what has been maintained. The other key factor that the Oslo Accords uh, facilitated was um, security cooperation between Israel and the Palestinian Authority. And that is essentially what is allowed. Uh, Fatah, the uh, party that Mahmoud Abbas uh, heads, to maintain um, itself in, in power. You, you may recall that upon Israel's withdrawal from the Gaza Strip, uh, and where that security cooperation was, was no longer present, uh, Hamas took over from Fatah in a, in a very violent coup. Uh, and so one of the key aspects that prevents a, a similar coup and a takeover in the West Bank, um, many, many people in the security um, uh, industry will, will uh, tell you is, is as a result of the security cooperation, um, which began with Oslo, but of course has manifested itself um, in, in through various independent agreements and security cooperation between those parties. I hope that assists somewhat, Robert. I hope so. So um, now the, uh, the first question that was posed was by uh, Judge James Shapiro. Uh, and uh, he asked, let me get back to that question over here. Uh, based on the, uh, the rule of law, which would assume that because the uh, the state was founded with an international recognized boundary. Uh, if it hasn't, if Israel hasn't simply annexed that portion, the West Bank, in the past 55 years, uh, why is that? Uh, is that showing consciousness of guilt that it's not entitled to it? So my answer to that would be: Israel cannot annex what is already its sovereign territory, and that's what Utiposidetis Juris tells us. Um, but so the, so the question, perhaps if I may rephrase it, is why has Israel not um, applied its full civilian law, law jurisdiction administration uh, to the West Bank or Judea and Samaria in its entirety in the same way that it has done with Jerusalem? Um, and, and that is a fair question because it has created this state of limbo and this very unsatisfactory patchwork of laws um, that I outlined just at the end of, of the presentation. And I think um, looking at, at the way matters were addressed and, and debated at the time in 1967, of course, this was a, an unforeseen development. It was a, uh, many considered it to be a, a miracle that the Jordanian forces were asked and that Israel recovered that territory, but it was not something that uh, had necessarily been planned for. And in advance of a peace agreement with Jordan and following uh, the um, framework of, of what became known and lauded as the process of land for peace, it strikes me that the authorities in Israel in 1967 anticipated that a peace agreement with Jordan uh, would involve land for peace uh, and a compromise, a redrawing of borders and an agreement between the parties on sovereignty going forward. And of course, that is how peace was achieved with Egypt in that in uh, that agreement, the Sinai was returned to Egypt, uh, which was also um, captured, not recovered in that case, but captured by Israel in that same war in 1967. Um, so the reasons uh, by, by which, uh, or the reasons for which I should say, Israel maintained that temporary administration um, had everything to do with its anticipation of, I think, a peaceful resolution with Jordan, uh, where Jordan would take responsibility for the local population living there and, and take some of that territory into its own country. Um, the fact that in 1994, when peace was achieved with Jordan, that wasn't part of the agreement has simply left us with this uh, 
limbo situation with this patchwork, this framework, and this Israeli uh, administration of the territory. But again, there's a, a continual hope that um, there will be a final settlement uh, and an agreement, if not between Israel and Jordan, then now between, uh, as you saw, the established Palestinian authority through the Oslo process to take responsibility uh, and to come to an agreement uh, whereby those temporary provisions under the Oslo Accords can be finalized. Thank you. Now, I'm going to skip forward to a question by David Friedman, uh, where he said, please touch on UN Resolution 242, return of, and then he puts in quotation, the territories. Uh, Actually, I do remember when this was being negotiated by Abba Ibn on behalf of Israel, and the uh, the the uh, the word pronoun uh, pardon me not the uh, the uh, was not in the uh, resolution. Yes. Uh, that resolution was handed out as part of the materials, and it was hotly contested because what happened was the resolution finally stated that Israel uh, aff- pardon me it affirmed that there would be a withdrawal of Israel armed forces from territories without the definite article because it wanted to leave the uh, the definition of which territory is subject to future negotiation. Uh, I hope I answered that correctly, Natasha. Uh, well, you certainly did. Um, perhaps I should also stress that uh, Security Council Resolution 242 made on Chapter 6, not Chapter 7. Um, so there's some debate as to whether the wording of it might constitute it to be legally binding, but certainly under the um, chapters of the UN Charter, it doesn't have legal status as a Chapter 7 resolution. And then you're absolutely right that the big debate thereafter was about the inclusion of the, uh, and the position that has been taken with respect to withdrawal from territories by the State of Israel is that it has indeed withdrawn from territories, not least the withdrawal from the Sinai, uh, which was um, as, as part of the peace process and, and, and the peace agreement with Egypt. Next question we had was from Josh Kreitzer. Would UN Resolution 181, the partition plan, not have superseded the uti posidatis juris uh, default rule by indicating that the country which became Israel was not planned to include all of the mandatory uh, portion of the land west of the Jordan River? These are great questions, so I'm extremely grateful for them. Um, The answer is that it, it doesn't supersede Uh, it doesn't have any legal status. As a General Assembly resolution, it is purely a political instrument. And crucially, it is a recommendation, a recommendation that was not accepted and certainly not implemented. Um, Unlike partitions, say, between India and Pakistan, uh, where there was an implementation of of, uh, partition, um, it it remains a a political recommendation, uh, one that I think there can be severe criticisms made of, Um, but because it wasn't accepted by the parties and because it was never put into any legal framework or any uh, legal implementation, um, it it doesn't have any impact. So we're essentially left with falling back on uh, the default rule in, in international law. And because Israel is the only state to emerge from the British mandate in 1948, uh, the application of Uti Posidetis Juris is, is, is clear. If there were multiple states to emerge, uh, as, for example, uh, states breaking away from the former communist federations, uh, then we would potentially be looking at other administrative lines uh, as those administrative lines that um, states emerging from, from former Soviet federations um, did. But uh, the, the fact of the matter is that in 1948, there was only one state to declare independence, and I think international law is extremely clear on, on what the parameters of that state are in that context. Next question came from Steve Bergman. Is the League of Nations agreement mentioned regarding Jewish people's establishment of homeland in Palestine ever rescinded or does it carry through the establishment of State of Israel or is it irrelevant after the United Nations and establishment of the State of Israel? So um, some people argue it does carry through and it carries through into the United Nations through Article 80 that I I referenced. Um, This is where my position does differ uh, from others that that do argue very forcefully that the international community did create binding legal instruments for the creation of the Jewish National Home in Israel um, and that those are an important part of the legal framework. Um, I think they are important to recognise and 
there is um, a, a crucial uh, context, both historical, political and legal, that surrounds them. Uh, but I prefer to look at this uh, in a general way and ask very simply that we apply the same rules to the formation of the state of Israel that we apply to any state coming into existence. And therefore, my preference is to fall back on what public international law and the rule of uti possidetis juris says. Uh, it is true that in Israel's case, there were even greater commitments by the international community, legal ones, to um, the promotion of, of the state of Israel, the establishment of the state of Israel. Um, those were arguably broken. Um, so, for example, when the British mandatory authorities prevented Jewish immigration, um, just as the, the Second World War was, was beginning and turned boats of Jews, in particular from Germany, back, uh, whose occupants found themselves thereafter in concentration camps. Um, you know, there, there were strong legal arguments that that was a breach of the mandatory's uh, responsibilities under the mandate to promote Jewish immigration, to promote so close settlement uh, of Jews in the land. But all of that, um, I, I think, is entirely superseded by what happens in 1948. And the strongest, clearest sense that you can get of what the legal status of the territory is, is from Israel's Declaration of Independence and what international law says about states at that critical date, the snapshot of the territory or the photograph of the territory, as the International Court of Justice called it. And we should simply apply the same rules, standards uh, that we uh, use universally to Israel's emergence. I've yet to hear, and I talk about this a lot, any explanation for disapplying this rule as the default rule in Israel's case. Michael Trayson has stated that the historical background and the law are all very interesting and that we're trained to follow the law, but wonders uh, how much more useful and relevant is focusing on the situation today. Uh, I imagine that he's advocating for uh, some new legal precedent or new laws to be legislated or treaties to be formed. I agree with him on that. Uh, we, we need to figure out a solution so that uh, there are people who are being treated like political pawns and who could have uh, decent lives with citizenship and full rights in whatever entity that would be. Uh, but do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Um, well, I, I began my remarks by saying um, the legal status is important for an informed discussion and the correct use of terminology, but it doesn't in any way predetermine what a political diplomatic resolution would be. Um, and of course, if parties do agree a binding legal agreement, then that will be the legal situation going forward. But the reason that it's so important to establish what international law says about the status of the territory in 1948 and how that carries through to what happens in 1967 is that it, it really puts the lie to what has become the received wisdom and what is increasingly being discussed by lawyers and non-lawyers. Um, these terms of illegal occupation, illegal settlements, uh, they are political terms. And I would go so far as to say that they are an abuse of the legal terminology. And as a lawyer, that is a, of a, a serious concern to me because I think it devalues international law and its power and application in other contexts outside of Israel. And I think to a certain extent, we're seeing some implications of that with respect to uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, but the legal starting point is crucial because it allows us to push back on misrepresentations of international law. Uh, it doesn't in any way, uh, I would suggest, um, prejudge what a political outcome and a negotiated uh, settlement solution would be. But I think it's important to inform it because it means that that settlement is negotiated on the basis of, of reality uh, and not of a, a false narrative or a false application of international law. Thanks. The next question from Jeffrey Bergman. If, Israel, if Israeli legal sovereignty should in principle extend to the mandatory lines, then would Israel have not just a right, but an obligation to apply civilian law throughout the territories? Is it relevant that Israel does not want to apply its law broadly to non-citizens living there? Um, it's certainly relevant because it's left us with the form of administration that Israel has applied, that it was established in 1967 uh, and that has evolved until today. Um, 
the reasons for Israel doing that, uh, and in fact, the government, has, as well as the Supreme Court, has referred to the situation there in many instances as a unique circumstance in international law. Um, I think the reasons for Israel doing that sprung out of the unique circumstances that it found itself in. And the alternative, of course, would have been imposing Israeli uh, jurisdiction, law, administration, uh, and indeed even citizenship uh, on um, a population that uh, would would very likely have been hostile um, to such a solution. So to the contrary, uh, what Israel has achieved in negotiation with the Palestinian leadership in the more late, uh, latter years um, since 1967 has been a Palestinian autonomy. Um, of course, that's temporary and it's up for negotiation as to where that develops into. But I think certainly um, fully within Israel's gift uh, to enable the Palestinian leadership to have self-governance in that territory. Um, and I don't see that it was required um, in those circumstances to apply, um, some people say sovereignty in full, but I think the more accurate uh, description would be administration, law and jurisdiction. Um, and you will see that even when proposals were made with respect to the application of administration, law and jurisdiction to parts of Area C, um, which it has generally been envisaged that will remain um, in Israel, will remain Israeli territory after a settlement agreement, there was international uproar uh, and the charge of annexation, um, falsely, I think, being levied in that respect. So Israel is to a certain extent damned if it does and damned if it doesn't. But legally speaking, the framework that Israel has established, albeit a sui generis situation, so uh, unique, um, it is, a, is one which is clearly workable in international law and subject to, of course, the ongoing political and diplomatic negotiations. Uh, Michael Burke posed a very open question, open-ended. To what extent is the legal status of Israel the product of real politic? I would suggest that you try and figure out how to answer that in one minute or less so we can get to the other questions. Um, so the legal status of Israel is clear under international law, and I think it, it's the same status that is afforded to any uh, newly emerging state. Um, the way it is discussed is absolutely um, influenced, I think, by, by politics and by political discourse. And if you will, Israel's decision um, not to apply its law and administration and jurisdiction in full to the West Bank um, could arguably be described as a result of realpolitik um, because Israel recognised the challenges um, that would ensue if it did that and sought a, a different approach. So the underlying status isn't affected, but certainly the way uh, that Israel has managed its relationship and responsibility to parts of the West Bank, um, I, I suppose I'd agree with the questioner there. Alone Stein asked the question, why is the ethnic cleansing of Jews from Judea and Samaria uh, never discussed? Obviously, he's referring to the period of time uh, between 1948 and 1967, uh, especially in the recent dispute over Shimon HaTzadik or Sheikh Jarrah dispute. Also, why can a synagogue not be built on the Temple Mount next to the mosques on the Temple Mount so that both major religions achieve equality on the Temple Mount? I'll suggest right now that you can answer the first question uh, and that we'll see if we answer the second question at the end of the questions, because that might be, unless you want to handle it in, in, in a summary fashion, because we have- I'll, I'll try and deal with it summarily, absolutely. So um, Sheikh Jarrah, absolutely um, a massive misrepresentation of uh, a legal dispute um, to do with essentially squatters in some instances and those with legal titles to the properties uh, that has been undeniably impacted by the political discourse around it in that the courts in Israel have given every possible opportunity uh, to those uh, that refuse to leave those properties to come to a, a negotiated settlement as opposed to um, turfing them out which many suggest would have been uh, the proper legal um, result. Um, so your reference to the ethnic cleansing of um, the old city of Jerusalem in particular and, and the West Bank in, in, in general um, is something which is simply not part of the discussion in the same way that the ethnic cleansing of Jews from the surrounding Arab countries is not really included in this, the discussion. But I think there's more of a political question than, than a legal one. Um, legally speaking, however, 
the difference in the way that uh, Israel has managed um, the return of property and, and the custodianship of property uh, after recovering that territory um, couldn't have been more different. Uh, and it is, it is in fact respected uh, the actions that the Jordanian custodian of enemy property took, even though those actions were entirely discriminatory against Jews and, of course, included that ethnic cleansing. Israel has, for the most part, abided by decisions that were made during Jordan's illegal occupation. That is the extent to which international law is upheld um, by the Israeli legal system. Uh, and so far as the um, Temple Mount is concerned, the questions there, and I mentioned the Supreme Court of Israel uh, determination on the Temple Mount being part of the state of Israel and all of the laws of Israel applying to it, including those of non-discrimination and equality. And that is a continual problem for the Israeli uh, authorities uh, because it's clear that uh, Jews do not have freedom of worship on the Temple Mount. That was a concession made at the time, uh, chiefly by Moshe Dayan, to the Waqf Authority in the name of peaceful coexistence. Uh, but there are many who would argue that it is uh, been the cause and, and develop of, of a great deal of tension um, because it has given the impression that there is um, freedom of Jeru freedom of religion in, in Jerusalem for everyone except for Jews and, of course, Christians uh, on the Temple Mount if, if they were to attempt to pray there also. Um, so that is a, a serious problem, and it's one where the legal obligations of the State of Israel are very much in conflict with the political concessions that it has made, often at the, uh, the great pressure of the international community. It's, by, it's far from the only example of that, but it's certainly one of them. Thank you for sticking to the legal analysis and not getting into the politics on those two questions. Uh, Judge uh, James Shapiro asked another question. If Israel is entitled to the West Bank under Uti Posidis Juris, uh, then why hasn't Israel simply annexed it in the past 55 years it has occupied it. I think you've already discussed this a little bit or a lot. Uh, if you want to summarize it very quickly, uh, to the extent you may not have said something, please do. Well, to the extent that we've seen the international uproar when this was mooted simply with respect to certain parts of Area C, um, I think it would be an absolute non-starter. Uh, again, not annexing, but applying Israeli jurisdiction administration um, and civil legislation in its entirety in the same way that it did uh, with Jerusalem. Uh, Robert Carton asked very simply approximately the same question. Let's move on to Alan Gabay. In 1948, the Arab population of Palestine substantially outnumbered the Jewish population of Palestine. If Israel was to be con constituted in the whole of the Mandate territory in 1948, it could not have become a Jewish state without denying the majority of its residents citizenship. How do you square this with your analysis? Um, so, Uti Posidetis Juris doesn't care about the uh, makeup of a territory. Um, or demographics, um, or indeed self-determination. It's a very blunt instrument, but it's one that we have to apply if we're going to be consistent in our application of international law. Um, so far as the uh, demographics are concerned, there are all sorts of, it depends when you go back to, and there are all sorts of reasons that you can point to for, for one um, metric over another. Uh, of course, I mentioned the prohibition on Jewish immigration into the mandate by the mandatory authority. Um, there are stats that have been provided, um, in particular by, by NGOs working in Israel, that indicate certainly in Jerusalem um, periods of time where the Jewish uh, population was certainly in the majority. Uh, and that undoubtedly um, suffered uh, during the British administration of the territory as the mandatory. Um, but you, the question at its essence of you know, what would have been um, is, is a hypothetical because, of course, Jordan um, annexed or sought to annex, but uh, occupied, ethnically cleansed uh, a substantial part of the mandatory territory. Um, and it was only much later that Israel uh, recovered it when it was already very well established as a state. So that's... Um, uh, a good hypothetical question, but one which uh, the state authorities were, were not sp specifically troubled with. The only issue I would add is that when you look at the Declaration of Independence, when um, David Ben-Gurion declared the state of Israel, he did stretch out his hand to the local Arab population. 
uh, and said, let us build this country together. And so the um, anticipation was that across the entirety of that uh, the uh, that territory, there may be a prospect um, to build a country in which uh, Palestinian Jews and Palestinian Arabs would be able to live uh, side by side. Of course, the 1948 war uh, of attempted annihilation of, on Israel um, put the lie very quickly to that. Uh, we have, I'm going to skip the one about the New York Times article for now, uh, but I'm going to go into Marsha Kramer's question. How long does a change of status in occupying a particular land take to establish custom for that status to be recognized as permanent, such as the authority over a particular area, specifically in occupation of the West Bank or the ceding of authority to govern access to the Temple Mount by the Islamic Waqf? Now, I know that there's a lot of terms that got thrown into that question, Marsha, that I'm sure Natasha is going to uh, clarify and straighten out because you've used occupy and uh, other things like that that we've talked about already. So rather than repeat yourself on, on the difference between those terms, uh, see what you can do because it's 1125. And out of deference to Marsha, who I've been working with to put this together, I'd like you to be able to respond. Of course. Um, so... Uh, with all of the caveats that uh, I certainly don't see this as a situation of occupation, um, the, the reference to custom it is very much more general. So it involves state practice across multiple instances. Um, I There have been, more recently, um, arguments coming from the US, um, in particular in the wake of September 11th, promoting um, a, an idea or a thesis of what's called um, instantaneous formation of custom. Um, and those uh, have not exactly become established in international law. Uh, but establishing custom out of one example it is not really the way that the that customary international law is, is seen to work. Um, so I'm just reading your question back again, specifically the occupation of the West Bank or seeding. Uh, the, my, the thrust of what I'm understanding from your question is, at what point does it become impossible to retreat, essentially, from the temporary situation that Israel established, um, be that with respect to Judea and Samaria or uh, even the Temple Mount? Uh, and I think my answer is that in both cases, the, the question as to the future administration is an entirely open one. Um, to the extent that uh, there is a, an agreement between parties that... Uh, rectifies uh, the legal uh, status or agrees upon a new one, that will be the new position going forward. So even, for example, with respect to Utiposidetus Juris, it only applies as a default rule to the extent that there is no contrary agreement between the parties. See, that, that's why it wouldn't have applied, for example, in the partition of India and Pakistan, because there was a contrary agreement uh, between the parties um, that was uh, facilitated by the international community. So um, there is no prejudice caused to future political settlements that will institute a new legal framework, even by the, after the passage of over 50 years. I hope that assists. Sana Hussein uh, has posed a question. Uh, if Area C is annexed, which I'm assuming you will interpret as being if Israeli civilian law will be applied to Area C, will Palestinian Arab legal owners of property located in Area C remain legal owners of that property? Yes, absolutely. There's no suggestion. Um, and again, this is some, some, some of the myths around this also surrounding Sheikh Jarrah. Um, the, I have to draw a, a clear distinction between state land and privately owned property. Um, and the questions around uh, the enemy custodian, uh, so forgive me, the custodian of enemy property uh, and how Jordan handled privately owned property, or the Jordanian custodian of enemy property handled privately owned property during Jordan's occupation um, between 49 and 67 uh, has implications for um, what the private ownership rights of, of that property are upon Israel's recovering that territory. But there's no suggestion that individuals are deprived of their private property rights. On the contrary, um, and this is the case for Palestinian Arabs, uh, they have a, a direct route to the High Court of Justice with respect to claims of personal property ownership, um, if, if they are able to substantiate them. Um, so 
when you hear about the building of Jewish communities, um, principally that is on state land, public land, uh, that has on occasion been designated for uh, those purposes for development. Um, but the suggestion that there is a, an expropriation of private, uh, privately owned property without any particular uh, serious justification. And we looked at, at one case in Elon Moret, where there was an attempted justification on, on the basis of military necessity, which wasn't accepted by the court. So that is a very high bar uh, that would need to be met. Um, just as you know, private property may be expropriated uh, by state authorities for, for a whole host of other purposes. We've, we've had a great deal of that in the context of building um, a new rail network, HS2, in the UK. Uh, but there's the, the questioner seems to be working on the basis that expropriation of private property is something that happens in the, as a matter of course, and, and that's absolutely not right. Well, we have condemnation proceedings in the United States also. Each state has laws, but it's a, a constitutional uh, taking that has to be justified by the state in order to be able to take the property. And then there has to be fair compensation for it. Yes. So uh, it's now 1130. There are a, a couple more questions. Uh, and uh, I don't think anybody is obligated to stay on at this point because the CLE was announced for one and a half hours. But if Natasha doesn't mind. Very I'd happy like to. to. Certainly. Thank you. Uh, David Friedman asked a question about a recent New York Times article uh, that stated that the, uh, the uh, Israeli defense forces were taking West Bank territory for a firing range and Palestinian Arab residents were being forced to live in caves. Uh, do you know anything about that? I haven't read that article. Uh, I do know of certain allegations that were being made, and certainly there was a BBC News report uh, that was pushing a, a similar narrative. Um, there are certainly um, real property disputes, um, specifically in Area C, um, with respect to competing claims that are... Hmm, deployed uh, and to a certain extent also uh, exacerbated uh, by international bodies in order to, uh, it seems to me, generate a, a front line uh, in those areas. I spoke to the Europe, um, well, no, I spoke to the Irish Parliament most recently uh, about its involvement in Irish aid funding um, outposts in, in the middle of nowhere um, as part of a sort of land grab attempt, establishing facts on the ground, not assisting local Palestinian Arab communities, but essentially seeking to uh, cause disruption to uh, the Israeli administration, in particular of Area C, and building that was entirely without planning permission and entirely unlawful. And some of those have taken place in land that had been designated, state land that had been designated uh, as firing ranges for the IDF. So it could be that that's the same instance, but I do know, and this is regularly documented by an NGO in Israel called Regavim, uh, that there are consistent initiatives that are uh, the beneficiaries of significant international funding to generate these sorts of, of disputes. And then it doesn't surprise me at all that they're written about in the New York Times. A uh, question for you uh, with regards to application of uh, British mandatory law, uh, where the uh, the home of a terrorist will be demolished, and the question of whether that's fair or collective punishment, uh, whether it's a, a true measure of deterrent for future terrorist acts, uh, perhaps you can comment on the origin of this British law that's been one of the holdovers in uh, in the the uh, West Bank. Um, so the, the Israeli practice uh, has been in, in entirely based on, as you described, that holdover um, of that being a consequence of engagement in, in terror activities. The question as to whether it's been effective, well, there have been a number of instances documented of where family members have shopped uh, individuals who were about to commit terror attacks simply on the basis that they did not wish to lose their house. 
uh, if their relative were successful in, in perpetrating that attack and they understood that that was going to be the consequence. So there are many that argue that it is an incredibly effective mechanism to deter terrorism uh, and that that is why Israel has maintained it uh, as, a, as a legal practice, having inherited it from the British. Um, I have uh, seen footage of, of some of these demolitions and to the extent that uh, they are not entire properties, entire houses, um, it's true that the authority, the IDF in particular, will seek to destroy only a part of a property or close it off. So there are different ways in, in which that has been implemented and manifested. But the general consensus, as I understand it, is that it is effective um, clearly, Israel is now in the midst of a, a further wave of terrorism, um, so it is not uh, entirely stamping it out. But for those sorts of issues, given that it is legally permissible, it will be a question, I think, first and foremost, for the security services uh, and the security authorities to determine whether it is merited and if they believe it is and may apply through the court process uh, for the the. Um, possibility of, of carrying out those uh, demolition orders. A follow-up question. Uh, was this British law applied in any other jurisdictions and is it still applied by uh, British rule anywhere else today? That's a really good question. I don't know the answer to it, but I'm, I'm going to go away and look it up um, because I'm only really familiar with, with its use in, in mandatory, in mandatory Palestine and, um, there are, of course, a number of other practices that the British adopted, uh, w which were far more um, uh, far more severe, which which haven't um, been continued by by um, the Israeli authorities. But that, uh, it's a question I'm afraid I don't know the answer to. But I shall Thank go you. away. It sounds it sounds like an invitation to a sequel, part <laughs> two. Uh, it's been absolutely wonderful your presentation of the law was very much appreciated. There there are so many presentations that are political on all sides, but as a, uh, a legal society, uh, we look to the law to provide answers. And uh, we really thank you very much for your time, uh, Only not only for, for right now, this morning, but this afternoon for you, uh, but especially the preparation time for the background materials, et cetera. Uh, and I thank everybody else who's participated, especially I want to thank Aviva Pat for all the technical support uh, to produce this uh, presentation for the CLE today. Uh, the uh, uh, questionnaire for CLE credits has been posted, and I hope everybody's responding to that so that everybody who uh, needs the credits can uh, can get them. Uh, and um, I thank you for supporting this program. We look forward, the Decalogue Foundation, to producing uh, more programs to advance legal scholarship, especially as it pertains to uh, Jewish legal and Israeli legal topics uh, that so often we're the only ones who will present. Uh, thank you all very much, and I wish you all the best, and once again, profoundly thank Natasha Hausdorff for a brilliant presentation. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Robert, for the invitation. Thank Love you. Love you all, and thank you for your questions.